Okay, want to welcome uh, to the program Alec McGillis. He is a uh, senior reporter for ProPublica, recipient of the George Polk Award, and author of his most recent fulfillment, Winning and Losing in One Click America. Alec, uh, welcome uh, to the program. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, and I'm here with uh, Emma Vigland. I got to tell you, you're, you're, the, the book is really, um, it, it's, it's fascinating. And I, um, it seems to be like a story of a lot of different things in many respects. But it, I, I got to say, I think it's like one of the best books to, um, to illustrate what people are talking about when they talk about the need for a reinvigorated antitrust in this country yeah. uh, because it shows how much broader the danger of of monopolization is than just uh, impacting workers uh, and i think that's really um uh just an impressive uh impressive thing give let's just start with this from from a consumer standpoint from like this the standpoint of all of us how how many how many people use Amazon? Just how big is it um, in terms of just a, a you know, uh, a, a retail outlet or I guess? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, it's hard for us to grasp really just how enormous and dominant it's gotten, especially, of course, in this last year when when so many more Americans, you know, turn to sort of a one click kind of existence um, during the pandemic. The, I mean, even before the pandemic, there were well over 100 million Prime members in America, which, you know, that's that that you can put that up against some election numbers, numbers in midterm election years. And there's more people in Prime than than you know, voting for voting in their in their um, in our democracy. The um, just this last year, sales went up 40 percent uh, year over year, you know, over already a huge base prior to the pandemic, um, 500,000 more people, four or 500,000 more people hired by Amazon. Um, that does not even include the 500,000 truck drivers they have, um, which are, which don't count as Amazon employees. Um, you know, this company stock went up 86% year over year. Bezos' wealth up $58 billion in a single year. Um, this, the, you know, the scale of their of their breadth, uh, uh, warehouse space went up 50% just in a year. Um, what's happened in the last year is just, it's so hard to grasp. And I think the one reason we actually have a hard time grasping it is that we all feel to some degree complicit in it um, because so many of us did rely on the company um, in our, in, in our, uh, <laughs> in our pandemic sort of approach, the, the alacrity with which a lot of Americans embraced the one click life this last year really was kind of something to behold. And there's a, there's a quality of, of, of this, of the story that you tell that is in some ways similar to like what we were talking about with Walmart, like 10 years ago. And I guess, um, Walmart still maybe the biggest, uh, I, 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 off the top of my head, I don't, but still the biggest employer in Amazon, I guess is number two. Yes. But there's another dimension to this story that is fascinating because we have this story of wealth inequality in this country and this concept of, of two Americas that has gone back for a while. But you and and, and this, I think, long, well-known story of, of a rural urban divide. But you outline a story of a um, of, of, of two Americas, but it's not necessarily urban rural. We, let's let's weigh into that because that really is the essence of this on some level there are major winners and losers that that amazon have created walk us through that yeah that it is the essence of it this book actually started not as a book about amazon but as a book about regional inequality these growing gaps between places in america um it's partly an urban rural gap um, but it's also a gap between cities between sort of winner take all cities like seattle san francisco dc new york boston and then a whole a much larger group of sort of left behind cities and towns um and 
and the book uses Amazon as a frame to sort of explain that problem. Um, and it's a, it's a very handy frame because it's so, so incredibly ubiquitous. So it's just everywhere. So just a good way to take you around the country and what we're becoming as a country. But it's also a, a good frame because it, it, it has itself contributed to this problem, to these regional divides, um, because the, the company has essentially, in a very blunt terms, kind of sucked all this prosperity and business activity um, out of a whole swath of the country and then kind of concentrated it in the places where it resides, um, you know, very much as other tech giants have, have done as well. Um, so you end up with sort of headquarters cities like Seattle and DC that are now just have all the sort of high paying jobs um, uh, for for the company. DC just got, you know, 25,000 more of these high paying headquarters jobs in, in that whole HQ2 bonanza. And, and then you have the, the sort of the warehouse towns, the cities that are now, that now have to sort of settle for the, the $15 an hour, very grueling, uh, very kind of atomizing warehouse jobs. And, and, and it's a situation that is really not good for either set of cities. That's, that's the important point. It's even the winter cities are struggling with, um, you know, credible housing affordability problems, congestion, massive displacement of longtime residents. And then of course, left behind cities struggle with blight and abandonment. So it's just, it's a very unhealthy th thing for a country to be this off kilter. And we, we simply haven't had gaps this big between, between regions before. This is, this is, this is a new thing for us. Yeah, I, I just want to I, I just want to um, uh, uh, put a fine point on that uh, the, that last thing you said, just so that people get a notion of just how much of a um, how much of a change this is for the country. Now, I, I know you're a, a, a Western Massachusetts guy. I grew up in Worcester, Mass, which is almost like the opposite of this dynamic. Worcester has been the mo one of the most static places probably in the country. You know, the like the 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 the. It never has a boom. It has never has a bust. It just sort of moves along. But that's sort of the way that the country as a whole was for a long time. Like just just outline that disparity before we start going into the specifics of the two ends of these disparities. Right. I mean, you you can quantify this. I mean, back in 1980, um, most of the country, there were very few parts of the country that had median income that was more than 20% above the average or below 20% below 20% of the average. So the most were kind of clustered around the average. Um, since then, huge whole swaths of the country have now fall above or, or below those extreme poles. Um, entire used to be that only the deep parts of the deep south and Appalachia would fall sort of way b below the 20%. Now entire swaths in the Midwest um, do and, and, and the Great Plains as well. Um, meanwhile, it used to be that just, you know, some suburbs of New York or DC would fall above the 20% line. Now entire sections of the coast are above that 20% line. Another way of looking at this, in the 1960s, the 25 wealthiest cities in the country included all sorts of cities in the Midwest. Um, Cleveland, Milwaukee, Des Moines, Rockford, Illinois, um, were the top 25 cities in the country in, in income. Now only only a couple uh, cities not on the coast make that make that list. There's just been this incredible sort of sorting out um, and a kind of hollowing out of of all of all these these cities that used to be doing pretty darn well. And, um, and so you've ended up, it's very similar to what we, what we have with our income inequality. I mean, we, we talk so much about the growth of the 1% and the top 10% and all that um, to unprecedented levels of inequality. And something very similar has happened at the regional level. And it's, and it's so unhealthy for the, for, for the country and for our politics. Can you expand on how Amazon specifically got to this point then? Just track it through time really, because it, Amazon started in Seattle. And then obviously it's exploded to this ubiquitous, all powerful force in, in this country and worldwide that we're seeing today. But just um, can you track along this dynamic how Amazon grew um, just through, I guess, the early 2000s to now? Sure. I mean, the the way to think about this 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 problem, this regional inequality problem and how it relates to big tech is is to think of it, so I think in two different, there are two different important points. One is that tech by its very nature has an agglomerating agglomerating effect. That's the, the fancy word that the economists use where it's a winner take all thing where you, 
a place like Silicon Valley happens, that kind of clustering happens because innovation happens in clusters. It happens in proximity. It happens when all these, you know, great minds are kind of brought in the same place with the venture capitalists. And uh, it's, it's different in that sense than the manufacturing economy, where once you had uh, a given industrial innovation, you could go out and use it, build a plant anywhere, anywhere where you had labor and, and natural resources. But with tech, you want to be in the same place. It's, um, you know, the, that, that human capital is, is all that matters. So it's drawing that capital together. So you have that agglomerating effect. That's why Amazon moved. One reason Amazon moves to Seattle, sets up shop in Seattle, is that Microsoft is already there. And so Amazon knows that it can draw some of that human capital, some of that tech talent away from Microsoft. Um, that's why it goes there. It also goes there because it's, it would be, it was going to be better for, for its taxes to go there. Um, but um, so you have that, that sort of basic agglomerating effect, winner take all effect in the tech economy. But then on top of that, the, we have, as Sam mentioned at the outset, we have been gotten so weak in our, in our application of antitrust in our country that we've allowed the giants to get so big that, um, and, and been so just soft in our, in our approach to that, that, that the agglomerating effect gets even worse because because you end up with just a handful of companies that are um, that are that have grown so dominant in the tech economy, which means that even more of the, the wealth of prosperity will be kind of be drawn to the places where where those few happen to reside. Um, you know, if there were if there were more of them, they would be in more places. I mean, all, I'm speaking very kind of crude terms here, but but instead there is the one Amazon that is now so immensely dominant. So Seattle ends up with, and, and then now DC ends up with this this extraordinary levels of of a kind of, of hyper prosperity um, that would that are more extreme than what would exist if if the if the if these giants had not had not been allowed to get as big as they were. There, there's like um, these things, their their gravity, their like gravitational pull uh, right. grows exponentially with their size. Right. And this notion of um, uh, uh, this agglomerating effect is 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 um, is fascinating. But let's talk about tax arbitrage because that was something that um, you know. In its founding, that seems to be like the, the Amazon and, and Bezos, I guess, had basically this very specific strategy, which was like, we could get paid to do the stuff that we're, is actually going to bring us value when it comes to these uh, locations that we're going to uh, land in. And we're also going to make sure that we don't pay taxes. In a, if we can avoid taxes at all costs, that's going to be a dictating factor. Walk us through that. I mean, that that has to do both with what they did online. They sort of busted in in the way that like almost like Uber does in, a, in a, or did back in the day in a city. Um, and they also placed their their logistics part of their logistics equation was taxes too it, absolutely tax avoidance was at the heart of their early success and, and for actually for years um as they grew the the whole the the way it worked was that you had this massive advantage for e-commerce as they started out in the 90s where you didn't have to assess sales taxes on your customer the way that a physical a, a, a rival's shop with with physical brick and mortar stores had to assess sales taxes um the the, the way the, the law was applied was you didn't have to assess sales taxes as an e-commerce seller if you didn't have a physical man a physical building in a given state so and that's a huge reason why amazon went to Seattle instead of Silicon Valley back in the 90s is that if, if they'd set up shop in California, they would have had to assess sales taxes on all their sales in California, which is, of course, the biggest market in the country. So instead, they go to a smaller state where it doesn't cost you so much to have to assess sales taxes on those people. And then in that, in the customers in that, in that small state, so they go to Washington State. The, the other then as the company grows, it's very kind of strategic about where it puts its warehouses. Because once you put a warehouse in a given state, you're going to have to assess sales taxes on sales in that state. So they actually avoid all sorts of larger states 
large population states for quite a long time as they're growing. Um, don't put warehouses there. Finally, they get to the point where the company is so dominant, is so huge, is so popular um, that that the um, and and is making these it's this pledge of two day delivery and then one day delivery, you know, to prime customers where the need to be closer to your customers wherever they are, um, you know, it becomes more important. So they start putting warehouses everywhere, um, even if it means having to. To, to, to assess sales taxes there. Um, but then, and then of course, on top of that, you have sales, sales avoidance on all, on, on many other levels as well, you know, with, with most notably at the federal level, um, you know, managing to keep their federal income tax bill incredibly low. Like it, it recent, some recent years it's been zero despite their incredible profits because the, of the way that they're able to move move profits offshore to Luxembourg to to claim huge losses um, and and so there's there's that whole game uh, which of course they're, they're not alone in playing that game a lot of the tech giants play that game and then um, and then they're also meanwhile they're also reducing their tax bill by beast being incredibly aggressive and in seeking subsidies and incentives from local communities where they're seeking to build warehouses and data centers. So, so even as they're basically being a, a, a grudgingly agreeing to start paying, assessing sales taxes as they expand, they're also getting massive subsidies and incentives from communities where they're going in to build their warehouses. All these towns and cities that are desperate for any kind of investment or jobs are throwing tax subsidies at Amazon to build warehouses that are that are going to have these these quite low paid low paid jobs as the reward. And, and let's be clear, I mean, even in places that aren't so desperate, uh, during this whole HQ right. uh, thing, people were willing to throw all sorts of tax breaks uh, for the idea that, that that Amazon would end up providing jobs there. When in fact, Amazon's going to end up providing jobs there if it's in Amazon's best interest to do so. At the end of the day, I mean well, that we was just, all that in New York City right? is what I was going to say, right? right. They, they're, they're, they came here anyway, albeit in a smaller capacity. But they wanted, on top of that, a bunch of taxpayer money to bribe them to come here, and it ended up, you know, they want to be in, in a, have a New York presence anyway. That's the uh, that's the best business move you can get is to get paid to do something that's already in your best interest. <laughs> exactly. Um, but so, all right. So this, um, the, I, let's go to some of the the stories that tell this story of this. You know, um, and 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 you said at the at the top that Amazon was the frame for this um, geographic disparity. In, in, in a in a really unique in the context of the history of the United States type of, of of disparity. And at one point, I want to circle back as to how it changes human behavior, right? Because there was a time where I'm like, oh, I'm living in Dayton. I think I'll go to, um, I don't know, I'll go to some other random city with 200,000 people. And my life could very well be more or less the same. And it's, and it's you don't have that flexibility of the mobility in the same way you do if you're looking for their similarly situated opportunities. But let's, let's, I mean, let's look at, um, I, I guess let's start with, uh, Bill Bod, uh, Bod da Donnie. I don't know how to pronounce yeah, it. But he, he really captures sort of like what has changed for a, um, a, I guess a similarly situated person, uh, looking for work that isn't necessarily white collar. Uh, and he's doing this in, um, uh, I guess this is in Baltimore. Yes, outside Baltimore. This was really, really is kind of like the the core chapter of the book that my, on on what's happened in this one spot outside Baltimore, where it's a place called Sparrows Point Peninsula, just just outside the city that used to be home to the largest steelworks in the entire world. Bethlehem Steel had 30,000 workers there in the late 50s, um, was there for the entire century and it's a huge company town. Um, and um, and Bill Bodani worked there for, for more than 30 years, um, was really tough work, had, you know, physically challenging work. Um, he had a bunch of injuries on the job, finally left the job after after one of these injuries. Um, but he really liked the work. He just felt this incredible sense of purpose there and camaraderie. And, and there's, a, there's a reason why he stayed working there for 30, more than 30 years, um, made really good money, you know, you know, well over $30 an hour by the end, incredible benefits. And, and um, but 
so he, he left that job and then the steelworks um, uh, went out of business as part of the sort of you know across the board decline in in the American steel industry um, and and this it's, it's kind of astonishing this entire massive steelworks this huge skyline of industrial skyline um, has been walk, wiped completely clean off of this peninsula it's just gone and and it's been replaced by um, by a, a bunch of warehouses it's now a a big sort of logistics business park, um, and and it includes not one but two Amazon warehouses now, and and Bill went back to work at one of these warehouses um, a few years ago. Um, yeah, he, he he was having health health troubles. His wife was having health troubles. He needed some mo more money, and he went back for a job driving a forklift there, making um, a fraction of what he'd been making at that exact same location for Beth Steel, um, with um, you know, a job that was now less dangerous than the one he had at Beth Steel, but but a job that he that he just couldn't stand. He he was not only making less money, he felt no purpose on the job, had no camaraderie, had no you know no sense of meaning whatsoever. Um, was was constantly sort of under the under the beck and call of of you know various young supervisors who were just uh, riding him to to make more. Uh, deliveries on the forklift from the trucks, um, not enough time for bathroom breaks. He's an older guy, had to go to the bathroom more often, never had enough time to go. A um, couple times ended up having to, you know, pull up his forklift and, and go behind the forklift and hope the cameras wouldn't catch him and um, got in trouble for, for trying to distribute some union literature um, to some of the younger workers there, kind of encouraging them to think about organizing. And finally, you know, finally quit just a few years into the job, just couldn't hack it. And, and to me that the story of his you know, of, of him in, in Sparrow's point is just really, it's just so emblematic of what's happened to, to work in this country, sort of the, the, the kind of work that the, that, that the mass of Americans, you know, now rely on and turn to once it was not that long ago was a job like the Beth Steele job. And now in that exact same location, it's the warehouse, the Amazon warehouse job and, and what's sort of what's been, what's been lost in that transition. And, and we should say also uh, his pension was diminished, which is, you know, like a whole nother uh, subset of this story, uh, obviously. Uh, but and, you know, the, the, the this stuff like with, with the with the the bracelet, the electronic bracelet, like if you're dilly dallying, then you get a, basically a shock. I mean, it's more or less. Um, uh, but this all of that just sort of um, uh, tells that the, that 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 disparity and that happens in one place but now we have this sort of the the regional disparity so let's compare like let's talk about dayton uh ohio because you you have another um um uh, a person that you you follow there and he is having um a, a very rough go of it uh as well um and this is to sort of uh show that disparity not so much in the context of time, but in terms of, of location between Seattle. Tell us about um, uh, uh, in yeah. Dayton. So Dayton is such an important place and it's an important story, you know, be, partly because, I mean, it it just shows what's happened to so many, it stands for so many of these Midwestern cities that were once really the kind of the, the font of so much innovation and prosperity in this country. And Dayton was, it was the Silicon Valley of its time. I mean, the people say that and it's true. It was the Wright brothers. It was all these incredible inventors and innovators um, in the early 20th century who came up with all these um, in, in advances that from which so much prosperity flowed, all these automotive uh, engineering advances, the cash register, all this stuff came out of Dayton um, and the Wright brothers. And and then now um, the city has just went through a terrible time in the, um, the really the first decade of the century, which is devastating to, to a place like Dayton, all these auto jobs, auto parts jobs um, lost um, following the w, China being admitted into the WTO, WTO was devastating to manufacturing towns like Dayton. Um, uh, then they get clobbered by the opioid epidemic. And so you have someone like Todd Swallows, who I focus on in this chapter, a young man whose father had a successful small uh, truck trucking company that took auto parts up and down the uh, the I-75 corridor up to Detroit. And um, but that business went, went bankrupt in the in the Great Recession. And and Todd is left as this young man completely on his own trying to make his way um, through a succession of just incredibly long list of low paid jobs. Um, 
you know, restaurant jobs, retail jobs. Um, and he ends up working finally in uh, making cardboard, making cardboard boxes. When I met him, he was living in a shelter with his family because they, their, their life had gotten so unstable that they're living in a, a large sh homeless shelter in Dayton while he's working at a, for a company making cardboard boxes for Amazon. And so he's sort of at the bottom of that ecosystem, bottom of the food chain that leads all the way up to, to the, the glimmering headquarters in Seattle um, with Bezos and the 17th floor dog park balcony um, in an Amazon tower um, where, where the Amazon headquarters employees can take their dogs out for a stroll on the AstroTurf with a you know, 17th story view of, of the Seattle skyline. And then there's Todd back in, back in Dayton making the cardboard um, really hit in his, and he's, he's, a, he's, he's quite, quite a young man. He has incredible work ethic. He's just kept at it all these years, but, he's, but you can just see so powerfully the effects of his economic instability and kind of an unraveling um, of him and the, the kind of the landscape around him. And he's been through, you know, it's the, you know, the, 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 his, the chapter there is pretty um, candid about some of the things that kind of come with um, that kind of um, downward, downward mobility and instability. Um, and, and it just, you know, it's just meant to show sort of what, what is really happening sort of on the ground at, at the, at the one end of that, of that, of that ladder. You see the knock-on effects of how it ends up. He becomes abusive, and and um, and and just the implications of having that amount of pressure, and really finding no way to get ahead, despite the fact that he is so determined um, uh, to to do it. There's just no, there's just no opportunity there. Uh, it's it's really it's heartbreaking. I mean, he's he just keeps. He so badly wants to be a good father and a good provider, the way that his father had been for him. But it's just, it's just a different, it's a different world that they're inhabiting now. Just, just twenty years later. I mean, there, there's. So you, you had mentioned up at the top that that, that Amazon was a frame to show this dynamic of 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 this new type of regional disparity or it's not even regional right i mean it, i mean it's, it's it's in some respects it's highly localized um disparity is amazon a, a frame for it or is it i mean how much does it contribute i mean let's say that we were to go back in time 20 30 years ago and say uh no you got to pay your, your taxes um and uh at one point we're going to not allow you to have such control over this marketplace that you've created. You can't, you can't take a vig on certain things. You can't um, push things that, you know, we're going to apply like a sin fin rule to your, to the way that you do your products. You can't own the product and also own the, the sort of the pipes that deliver it. We were to do all this um, and we figured out some way, I'm not sure how we would do that where it's like, diminish the value of aggregating all of the techies in one area, whether it's, you know, I, I, I will, you know, 128 in, in uh, mm -hmm. Boston or, um, or, you know, in Seattle, uh, Austin, Texas, maybe uh, is trying to like, w would this problem still exist if we were able to just deal with Amazon or is Amazon like a main driver, but also indicative of a bigger problem? It's definitely both. I really see it as both. I see, and I had you know a lot of discussions with Amazon about this, of course, because they, you know, I did talk to them at length for the book, and their basic, their basic, you know, counter was, if it weren't us, it'd be someone else. You know, if the, there are these larger structural forces, there are these changes, changes in technology. The internet was going to happen. E-commerce was going to happen. Um, it it would have been someone else with some other name, but it just happens to be us. Um, you know, what I think that misses is that, is that yes, of course there are these larger, larger structural things that have happened, but the, but the company has made specific decisions, you know, and actions over the years that have made things even sort of worse in these ways, you know, whether it's this particularly aggressive pursuit of, 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 uh, tax avoidance or, um, you know, or the decision to put HQ2 in Washington, which they didn't have to do. They could have tried to make it work somewhere else. They could have tried to, you know, make it work in St. Louis or to be, or there being especially, you know, the, the productivity demands on, in the warehouses being especially 
draconian as they are. Um, but so Amazon's choices have, have, have made this worse than sort of the generic scenario, but, and, but, but, and by the same token, we as a country have made it worse by, by allowing, by, by not doing some of the things you mentioned, by, by letting things, letting the giants get as big as they are by, by just let, letting it all be so untrammeled um, that we absolutely, it did not necessarily have to be this way. And it, 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 we could have mitigated it, whether we, you know, whether of course certain forces are still gonna push us in certain directions, but, but you could, but you can, things are always on a scale. I, I don't like thinking of things as one way or the other way, things are on a scale. We didn't let, let things have to get so extreme on the scale. And, and it's why these fights that are looming now um, in Washington, you know, on, on the, on the antitrust front are so important because because there one can certainly do things to to mitigate and to and to somewhat moderate these these extremes so, so i guess that brings us to the anti you want to go sam well i there was i, I just want to just pursue that one thing because there's two things right there that we can do on the mitigation front one is it's happening in bessemer alabama right. um, that is sort of a unionization to to uh to to just help uh workers uh, but the the antitrust thing shows like the implications of having a corporate behemoth that has an outsized political power. We see it in the context of taxation. We see it in the context of what they of their ability to just sort of like, you know, uh, dangle uh, cities around by their, you know, their nose or whatever it is. But is this is it also like an inevitability? Because I actually believe when Amazon says if it wasn't us, it would be someone else. That is an that is an indictment of maybe our system, right? Like, I mean, yes. is a problem with capitalism, period, full stop? Um, I, I mean, maybe that's a, you know, uh, it depends on your ideological um, uh, position, but it, but it seems like they're right. If it wasn't Amazon, it would be somebody, you know, I don't know, the Nile or whatever, <laughs> uh, you know, like uh, some other entity. Yes. Um, though, again, I would say a... a I, I, st I believe I believe in structural forces. I also believe in personal agency and and kind of corporate agency and corporate responsibility. And it, and I do believe that that there are certain ways that Amazon has grown and behaved that 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 might have been different if it were a company not led by Jeff Bezos and not led by a certain kind of ethic um, that that came from, you know sort of from him and kind of characterized this this one company, but. But absolutely, we we as a country, you know, let this happen, and it really has so much to do with, with our, just this complete shift in our approach to, to 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 monopoly. And you know, we we had a we had a big problem with monopoly in this country in you know around the turn of the 20th century, um, and and we and we took it on and. And for decades, we we recognized this problem and we tried to push back on it. Um, we and and that all that fell away in the last few decades, these last past few decades, where we have adopted you know what's known as the sort of consumer welfare approach to to monopoly, where hey, as long as the prices stay low for us to buy our our stuff, nice word for it, uh, you know, online. Um, what's the problem? If the prices are low, you know, it's fine for the consumer. There's nothing to worry about, and that's that has been the overriding approach to, to to monopoly and antitrust. And and uh, people, you know, minds, you know, uh, much um, people much smarter than me on, on economics have have explained in recent years, you know, all the all the reasons why this is flawed and why this is inadequate and why why there's other ways that we should be thinking about, about corporate power um, and dominance and just dis the distorting effects of that kind of dominance. And, and so very belatedly now we're sort of, we are revisiting this um, and, and that's, that's, that's what's at stake now in Washington. So we've reached this point while, as Amazon has kind of, I, it's, it's hard to imagine them getting any bit, bigger, but they, they could. Um, and I, I think there's kind of an impasse for at least Democrats who are now in power in Washington, right? Because they have traditionally been cozy with big tech, but now yep. you have someone like 
Joe Biden speaking out about the Bessemer strike and speaking out in favor of the unionization, or not strike, I should say, unionization efforts down in Alabama. So um, what is the path forward there? Because I think this is kind of a reckoning for Democrats and their relationship with these uh, tech behemoths and uh, per per perhaps pursuing some antitrust action. It's absolutely, you nailed it. It's an absolutely a, a, a reckoning within the Democratic Party. I mean, it was the Democratic Democratic Party has has been has been incredibly tight with big tech um, for you know these last few decades. That 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 has been where that's been the affinity really. Um, you know, in terms of just their their political leanings, their 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 giving, and you know the revolving door. I mean, just so many people going from the Obama administration into big tech, including Jay Carney. You know, who's the head of the whole PR. Um, uh, Government influence, government lobbying team at at Amazon, um, and and so now the question is, you know, and then, and then and then more broadly, of course, that you have the fact that Amazon is Amazon's is universal, but its strongest demographic really is is as consumers is the up middle class, upper middle class, uh, highly educated urban consumer in big metro areas. That's the Amazon bread and butter. That's that's why those boxes are piled up outside New York apartment buildings um, and in, in the lobbies. And and um, the Amazon was the the amazing poll just a couple of years ago, the most trusted institution among in the entire country among Democrats, more than the press, more than higher education, more than unions, more than government. Um, so there's a deep, deep affinity um, between big tech and and Democrats, um, both at the sort of at the elite level and and just generally speaking. And so now, you, but now you have people like Elizabeth Warren, Lena Khan, um, people you know, people on the left who have, you know are who recognize how uh, out of whack things have gotten and are very incisive about what has to be done about it. And and it's going to be a fight really within Democrats. You know, is basically is the Biden administration willing to take a different path than the Obama administration did? The Obama administration presided over eight years of massive galloping growth by the giants. And and it's there's it's going to be really interesting to see if if there's a if there's a rift there and a new approach. In fact, there was uh, just a big uh, release of uh, documents about the 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 Obama administration's handling of Google's Google, experience. exactly. Um, we will get into on this program later. And I just I, I want to reiterate just sort of what, what I think is amazing about your book is that we have talked on this program many times about the sort of the, the change in the the perspective on antitrust uh, around uh, that that happened with, with Robert Bork and, um, and and Ronald Reagan in the early 80s and the shift to consumer welfare as opposed to a sort of a broader uh, perspective on it. And so if people want to understand what the implications are of a monopoly like this and its knock on impacts that are really like, I mean, it's amazing how far down the, the, the road it goes, what's downstream from this type of monopoly. One of those things I just want to touch on before you go is that concept of the, the what it has done to mobility uh, uh, for people when they move, like the decision to go from, uh, you know, from a Boston to a Dayton, or from a, you know, um, uh, I mean, pick a city, I guess, uh, and to uh, to another is so dramatic relative to what it was even 30 years ago. Um, like what, where, where do you, where, how does that play out? Like where else yeah. do you see the implications of that? No, it's, it's a real problem, this, this lack of mobility and it, and it goes in both directions. The, you're much less likely now to make a move from a place that's struggling to a place of greater opportunity than you used to be. Um, that Those moves are happening much less often, you, you, even though you think people would want to go to the opportunity, go to the jobs. But as these gaps have gotten so much bigger, it's so hard to like come in at the lower rung of a city like a San Francisco or Seattle um, from a struggling place. Because where would you even begin? You, you, you're going to be starting at, a, at, at some low, low wage job in one of these cities and you simply won't be able to afford it. Like you're, you, there's, the housing affordability problem there has gotten so extreme that you 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 don't even know where you'd latch on in in, in a place like that. Even if there's in theory more opportunity, um, the fact that is the low wage jobs there are still low wage, and the, and it's just really hard to 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 afford life there. Um, on top of that, you also have the sort of the breakdown of the, of the family 
makes that kind of move much harder too. Um, you're back in the day, the Jodes could move from Oklahoma to California um, because you have Ma Jode, and Tom Jode, and 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 you know if, if Tom's working, you know, in the picking fruit in California, you know, you have Ma Jode to take care of the kids. Now, with if you're a single mom in in um, you know Appalachian Ohio, you're relying on your mom or your sisters to take care of your kids while you're working maybe you're not it's gonna be really hard for you to pick up with your kids and just move to um move to northern virginia you know who's going to take care of the kids while you work it's just that's that's tougher then going the other way you know it's much tougher for more more conceivable for someone a highly educated person to take sort of take a you know if, they, if you see some you know cool job in buffalo that that seems in, in you know interesting or in rochester or wherever it might be say you're in biotech and there's some cool biotech thing in rochester you're much less likely to make that move than you used to be because you're you're much less likely to spend your whole career in a, in a given place you want to have a whole bunch of companies in your field in the same place you you want the cluster as for security and so you're much more likely to stay in boston because that's where you have all, a whole bunch of those jobs around. Um, if you're also, you also likely have a a professional partner, um, you know, who's like you, a professional, you know, well-educated professional. She, he, or she is going to want needs a good job too, and they. So, it's um, they're going to ask, well, what am I going to do in Buffalo? Um, it's the clustering just is constantly sort of self-reinforcing in that way. And then on top of the fact, there's this, there is the tendency of now of high, of well-educated professionals, um, upper income people to want to live amongst each other. There, that's been shown that there's the high earning, earning people are much less likely to now to live in sort of mixed income neighborhoods. They, they they seem to be taking comfort of, from, from sort of living amongst their own um, in, in certain neighborhoods and suburbs and what have you. So all of that, just you have this constant self-reinforcement where there's very little mobility between the two kinds of places. Um, it is, uh, it is a massive problem. And um, I don't even know how we begin to address it beyond, um, uh, you know, either some type of wholesale change in our system or uh, these mitigating uh, um, uh, suggestions that you had. But Alec McGinnis, uh, McGillis, it's a, it's a fascinating book. Uh, the, uh, we will put a link to Fulfillment, Winning, and Losing in One Click America on uh, Majority.fm. Thanks so much for your time. Right. Thanks so much to both of you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much.